Martha for that reading that she's had there. The letter of the Apostle Paul to the Philippians. And this is a letter he wrote to the church that he had established in northern, current, modern-day Greece. And in today's scripture, Paul begins in verse 1, encouraging the believers to rejoice. And then he goes on to warn about evildoers that put their confidence in the flesh. And he's alluding to a faction of Jewish believers in Jesus that we hear about a lot in his letters. And they're coming around to these non-Jewish believers saying, you know what, it's great that you believe in Jesus, that's awesome, but it's not enough. You need to add to what he's done for you and observe the law, especially circumcision. And they are saying that trusting in Jesus is just not enough. And to be honest, this really pisses all off. Because it is such an affront to the God of the universe who sent his son to die for us to be to suffer, to go through the scourging and have death, even death on a cross. For anyone to suggest that that is not enough is as offensive as it gets. And this is why he's so upset. And I want to know, this is not all Jews, right? This is a group of Jews. Paul was a Jew. Jesus, by the way, was a Jew. It is a certain group. And verses 4 through 6, as uh, Barbara read, Paul is saying, if you want to talk about being a good Jew, let's talk about it. And he goes on to lay out how he is the superior Jew. And he just does it, bam, 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 seven things in a row. He goes, you want to talk about being circumcised? I was circumcised on the eighth day when you're supposed to be circumcised to the letter of the law. I was one of the people of Israel. I'm not some convert that came in later. I am an Israelite. And not only that, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. Now, the tribe of Benjamin was highly esteemed among the 12 tribes of Israel for a number of reasons. Number one, of all the, the leaders of the 12 tribes, only Benjamin was actually born in the promised land. And by the way, you know what the first king of Israel was? Saul. And Saul was a Benjamite. And in fact, Paul, who's writing this letter before he was converted, his name was actually Saul. He was named after that first king of Israel. And number three, Benjamites were loyal. You know, in the Old Testament, when the kingdom fell apart, the kingdom of Israel was split in two. Only the tribe of Benjamin stayed loyal to the tribe of Judah where the kingship lay. And number four, they were pure. They were members of the tribe of Benjamin, one of the few that could trace their lineage all the way back to the founding because they hadn't interspersed with the Gentiles around them. And he goes on to say Hebrew. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. I was born of two Jewish parents. There's no non-Jewish blood in me. And not only that, he learned and spoke Hebrew. Not like a lot of the Jews that day, they called them Hellenistic Jews because they had taken on the Greek culture. They spoke in Greek. And the Greek culture had infused the way they lived. Not Paul. He is claiming the elite status among the Jews. He's basically saying, I'm a Jew's Jew. Regarding the law, he says, I'm a Pharisee. And not only was he a Pharisee, he was born a Pharisee. His father was a Pharisee. He studied under Galilee, who was one of the leading Pharisaic teachers of the day. And why does being a Pharisee matter? Because these are the guys that took God's law seriously. More than any other groups in, in, in Judaism. They didn't just follow the Torah. They followed the oral law, which was this massive amount that was eventually codified in what we call the Mishnah, that almost said in every little detail, how do I follow the law? What does Sabbath mean? Right? I'm not supposed to work on Sabbath. And they codified the law. He followed that. And as for zeal, you want to talk about zealous? He was personally feeling the church. He was following them to the ends of the earth, basically, to persecute them and kill them. You know, throughout the Old Testament, those who are called zealous for God were seen as the true servants of God. 
And the archetype being Phidias, if you remember that name, not from the cartoon. Phidias was a zealot for God. And Paul is placing himself here as a representative of a new Phidias. And it's ironic because he thought he was being zealous for God and he was actually persecuting the church while doing it. And then finally he said, as for righteousness, based on the law, I am faultless. And that means two things. Number one, not only did he not ever intentionally sin, but he's saying, I need to sin by omission. I am faultless. So Paul can stab him against anyone that comes in and tells these people, you need to act the word of Jesus. And he's saying, no way. And as we're going to learn about next week when Brian comes and preaches, all these qualifications he just said, he considers them worthless compared to being in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And this is why he starts this chapter off, and don't miss it, telling the Philippians not just to rejoice, but to rejoice in the Lord. Whereas N.T. Wright was a great theologian, Translates it to celebrate in the Lord. You know, we use these words in church that we don't use anywhere else. And I think, frankly, rejoice is one of them. When's the last time in a conversation outside of your church, someone says, oh, it's birthday. You know, I just want to rejoice with you. No, you celebrate birthdays, right? You celebrate. So I'm going to use that word where it says rejoice in your translation just because I think it. it it connects with us more in our culture and in our time. So it's a directive. He says, celebrate throughout the Word of God. We hear this, not just here, but especially here. Just last week, Tim Brady talks about several characteristics in the life of Timothy and Epaphroditus, two other believers. And the first characteristic Tim mentioned was that we would, that they, we would aspire to be people who celebrate especially when others are celebrating. Tim, you here? Yeah. Yeah. You didn't think I was listening, did you? No, I was listening. And you had six characteristics, by the way. But in case you mentioned, I just mentioned seven for Paul. And as we all know, seven is the number of completeness in the Bible. So nobody's counting. Let's get back to celebrating. Why is celebrating so critically important to Paul and, and therefore to us? And for the remainder of this morning, I want to focus on four questions about this concept of celebrating. Number one, what is the basis for our celebration? Number two, when are we called to celebrate? Three, how do we celebrate? And then finally, why should we celebrate? And the basis is lined out for us right in verse one. It says, we celebrate, that the basis of our celebration is that we are in Christ or in the Lord. And if you recall three weeks ago, when we were studying chapter two of this same letter, we looked at how being in Christ was the foundation of living self-sacrificial lives, of serving others, not just ourselves. And we talked about three qualities in Christ that aligned with what Dr. Ekman had said when he went through that study with us of the Trinity. And I'm going to run through them again because this is the basis for our celebration of believers. Number one, we are loved and accepted by God the Father. Ephesians 2, 4 through 5, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our sins, in our mistakes, in the things we do wrong, even then at our worst point, he made us alive together with Jesus Christ. By grace, we have been saved. Number two, we have tremendous worth or value through the sacrifice of the second member of the Trinity, the Trinity, our Lord Jesus. At our core, at our identity is no longer defined by what we get right and what we get wrong. That's not what defines us. Our successes or our failures don't define us. Our insecurities, our selfish desires, 
That does not define who we are. We are defined by our union with Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 1 through 2 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set us free. We are free in Jesus Christ from sin and death. Amen. We are worth what? A son. We are worth a son. Paul, you are worth a son of God. And finally, we are secure through the Holy Spirit, and that gives us confidence. The third member of the Trinity, he has literally been given to us. The second was died on the cross for us, and the third has been given to us and indwells us. Ephesians 1, 13 through 14 says, when you believed, I'm talking about you, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. He is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. We are sealed. We are guaranteed. We are new creations. We have confidence because we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. We're highly valued because Jesus died on the cross for us. And we are loved by the God of the universe. That is the basis of celebration and that does not crumble, amen? So when do we celebrate then? You know, it's, it's interesting that this letter is written by a man who is suffering in prison to people that are suffering through persecution, and the main theme is celebration. Isn't that incredible? Eight times in this little letter, this four-chapter letter, Paul uses the same Greek word for celebrating. And he repeats it, and he tells his audience is repeating it. In here, in verse 1, he says, Celebrate in the Lord. It's no trouble for me to write the same thing to you again. And we'll find in chapter four, verse four, he says, celebrate in the Lord always. Again, I will say, celebrate. Do you think he wants us to do this? In addition, Paul emphasizes this command to celebrate throughout his writing, and specifically in 1 Thessalonians. Listen to what it says. Chapter five, verses 16 through 18. Celebrate when? Always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. So Paul's directive to us is to celebrate and keep celebrating. To celebrate always. It begs the question. Which is the third one that I listed. And specifically, well, how do we celebrate in difficult circumstances? How do we celebrate when the bottom falls out? How do we celebrate when we lose a loved one? When a, when a young man has cancer. And I think we gain perspective on that if we remember what Doug talked about in chapter one when he shared what he's going through. And he said, we live in a broken world and we have hardship and none of us is immune to it. And to be fair, some of us seem to have a lot greater hardship than others. But remember, God never brings the hardship and the chaos, but he will use it if we allow him to and if we hold fast to him through it. And what I want to do is I want to look at two examples from Scripture of what we should focus on and celebrate when we go through difficult times. You willing to go through that with me? Are you sure? All right. The first is in Paul. Philippians, a little bit farther down in chapter one. Jake, you staying with me? Good. (laughs) Notice how I didn't let him answer. (laughs) Verse 15, chapter one, verse 15 of Philippians. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from good, goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. This is Paul speaking. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. Again, Paul's in prison. And these prisons are way worse than the prisons we even have now. There's no food, there's no medical aid. You gotta rely on people to help you out. And he doesn't know if he's getting out. He doesn't know if he's gonna be executed. He doesn't know if he's gonna die there. Meanwhile, there's other people on the outside that are taking advantage of that fact, 
for selfish reason and trying to become Christian preachers. Now, the natural instinct would be to get discouraged, to be depressed, to feel victimized, to feel sorry for yourself. I would do it. (laughs) And you know what? There's legitimacy in that feeling. But there's no value or benefit from it. But what does Paul do? What What does our apostle do? In verse 18, he says, What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I celebrate. Why was he celebrating? Because of the good that was occurring in the midst of his suffering, and even through the bad motivations of the people were preaching, Christ was being proclaimed, and he chose to celebrate that. I want to look at one more example from the Old Testament of celebrating in difficult circumstances. And for this, we're going to roll it back to the book of Habakkuk. And if you know who Habakkuk is or you don't, he was one of what's called the 12 minor prophets in the Old Testament. And he was in Israel when the Babylonians were bearing down. Now, the Babylonians were the superpower of that day. And they were coming, and they weren't going to get stopped. The Ephesians, or excuse me, the Assyrians had come before, but they didn't conquer Jerusalem. This time, it's going to get conquered And the story is, afterwards, the Israelites go into exile for 70 years. And at the end of this book of Habakkuk, it's a short book, three chapters. It's a very dark time. And this is what he writes in verse 16 through 18. I heard and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. Yet... I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. Though the fig tree does not bud and there's no grapes on the vines, the olive crop fails, the fields producing nothing, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will celebrate in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. So here you have this guy on one hand. He is so scared His heart's pounding out of his chest and his legs are shaking. And yet he says, I will wait patiently. And what that word means when he says, I will wait patiently, is he is feeling a deep peace for God's future salvation. He says he's going to wait patiently for the day of calamity on the nation invading us. That's not going to happen for 200 more years about, okay? But he has peace about it right then, right now, when the enemy is coming in and they're starving to death. You know, this is a choice to celebrate. It's not based upon feeling, and it's certainly not based upon circumstance. But from years of knowing his God, Yahweh, and remembering God's faithfulness. In fact, this chapter in many ways, if you read the whole thing, parallels the story of the book of Exodus. And he's pre-Jesus, right? So Exodus was his salvation story. And notice he says he will celebrate, not once, but twice he says it. At, in verse 18, he says, yet I will celebrate in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. With Habakkuk, we see he remembers God's faithfulness and repeatedly celebrates in difficult circumstances. And what is the result? And if we look at the last verse of the last chapter of that that book, 319, this is what it says. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like feet of a deer and he enables me to tread on the heights. So this is This is metaphoric language. But what he's saying is, I responded to suffering by celebrating the goodness and faithfulness of God, and the result was that God brought me to a place of emotional safety and of strength and to have a perspective. He's up on the mountain, he said, right? He's got a vantage point to see beyond the current suffering to the future hope and blessing and victory of God. So to answer our question, how do we celebrate? We've gotten two examples from the text. Number one, we look for the good that God is doing in the midst of this celebrate. We don't celebrate the suffering. 
we celebrate the good that God's doing through it. And number two, we celebrate the good that he has done and we know he will do. And that will give us the vantage point. That will give us the perspective to move through it, to not only survive it, but to thrive it. And finally, why do we celebrate? And I think the standard Christian answer, I feel like Doug up here, I'm spitting a lot, sorry. I feel like this, the standard Christian answer is because God is good and he deserves our praise. And you know what? That's true. But what I find interesting is what Paul says at the end of the verse one in scripture today. Let me read it to you again and listen. Further, my brothers and sisters, celebrate in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same thing to you again, and it is a safeguard to you. Celebrating keeps us safe. But safe from what? I think in the the immediate context of the letter, two things pop up. Because immediately after this, he talks about the false teachers. The false circumcision, who we talked about earlier today. The ones trying to lay additional human effort on top of the work that Jesus did to save us. But if we are constantly celebrating the truth of who we are in Christ, and that's why I repeat it a lot when I'm up here, and what Jesus has done for us, we are much less susceptible to the false teachers and whatever doctrines they're spewing. If we continue to remember and celebrate that we are loved and accepted by God our Father, that we are worth a son, a son who cleansed us from all our sins, we're not defined by that stuff anymore, and that our salvation is ensured by the deposit of the Holy Spirit inside of us, the false teachers can have little sway over us. The Trinity is enough. And number two, we're safe from division. You know, another theme that goes through this book that the letter addresses is selfishness and divisive behavior. If you remember from a few weeks ago, Paul called the Philippians to model themselves after Jesus who suffered and sacrificed his life for us. Remember that? It was called the hymn of Christ. Telling them to look out for the interests of others, not just themselves. As one preacher put it, They said, if we consistently and accurately understand what Jesus has done for us, like if we truly internalize it and hold on to it, we would never act selfishly again. Think about what he did for you. How can we hold a grudge or an offense against anyone else when we truly understand all he's forgiven us? And each of us know what he has forgiven us. You don't know everything he's forgiven me for, and I don't know everything he's forgiven you for, but I know it's a lot. And I know what he went through was a lot. (laughs) And the payment that he made for that forgiveness. So those are two examples from Philippians, and I think there's, there's one other I wanted to talk about this morning. And it's, that celebration keeps us safe from discouragement and disillusionment. And this is a big deal for all of us. You know, the enemy is prowling about like a lion, looking for someone to devour, scripture says. He is constantly looking to rip us apart and to make us ineffective for the gospel of Jesus Christ. That, this is why the practice of celebration is so incredibly critical. If we are constantly celebrating in the Lord, celebrating what he has done for us and his body, the enemy cannot gain a foothold. And I've seen this in little things in my own life. Uh, You know, a lot of you know about me going through a long time without work, and about but about 10 years, 10 months ago in that process, I was pretty down and getting discouraged. And um, people in our small group knew about it. And uh, in September of last year, Tammy Afto, I think most of you know who Tammy is. She's in our small group. She sends me a text. She goes, I heard this song, and I immediately thought of you. And at the same time, coincidence, 
I've been listening to a podcast because I've, I've just, you know, I've, I've struggled with depression for a long time. I've been on medication for it for a long time, 12, 15 years. And uh, these two things came together in a difficult time. One was this simple song from Tammy. The other was this podcast about, of all things, cold plunges. And I know. But I will tell you, the confluence of those two things and this, the pressure I was under not having a job led me to create a new ritual in my life. And every morning for the last 10 months, and I tell you, I don't think I've missed one. I get up in the morning and I either do a cold plunge or I take a cold shower and I listen to that song. And it's a worship song. And it's a celebratory song. And my, uh, this is for you, Andy. My favorite verse is this. When the devil comes, try to get me, gonna praise the Lord. Amen, brother. <laughs> Every morning, I get up. I don't care how I'm feeling. And let me tell you, I don't want to get in a cold shower. <laughs> we were up in Tahoe with friends, and there's a cold creek out behind the place. And I got up every morning and got into that cold freaking creek. I didn't want to do that. But I tell you, I did it because I knew it was a discipline I had to do. And I always do it. And I listen to that song, and I celebrate God. Nothing to do with the circumstances. And I'll tell you, it changed my life. I am no longer on antidepressants. 12 years and I'm off. Amen. <laughs> and, and you know, I mean, since then, has it been, I haven't been perfect, right? Kimberly will vouch for that. A couple times I've gotten discouraged and depressed, but they've been short and I don't think it's been more than two. And that's really freaking impressive. So that's a huge change for me, all because I got this thing right. I get a few things right. I get a lot wrong, but I get a few things right. And this one I got right. And, it is, and I, I created a discipline of celebration. And there's others in this body that have learned to celebrate in much more difficult circumstances. Shelly's here. Shelly Robinson, who uh, had an accident years ago, left her in a wheelchair. She could have recoiled into bitterness and discouragement, but she chose not to, not because of the circumstances. She chose to hold on to Jesus. She chose to be here with us to celebrate the good things that God is doing. Amen? You know, recently, her family van, they got a special van. It's retro retrofitted for a wheelchair to go into. It broke down. So people from the church and the church and her family got together. They bought a new van, but that van was in Texas. You know what happened? A couple from this church flew to Texas and drove that van back for them. Amen? These are things we need to celebrate. We don't see them, but they're happening. And we need to celebrate this stuff. People are sacrificing for one another in Christ. Most of you know Greg and Marion Armstrong. And they lost their son, Brandon, about 12 years ago. And I called Marion yesterday just to make sure it was okay. Can I, can I share this story as examples of people in our body that have been able to celebrate in the Lord even though they went through one of the most painful things you can go through as a parent. And Marion said yes, but Marion being Marion was quick to point out, you know, I was angry at God at first. She didn't want me to sugarcoat it. I don't think Marion sugarcoated anything in her life, even cereal. <laughs> and, and when Marion said this, I remember that famous theologian. What's, what's that theologian's last name? McBride. <laughs> Betty McBride. And I don't know if you were here, but one Sunday, another person was talking, and Betty McBride said, you're not Jesus. Yeah. Amen? And none of us are. None of us are perfect, right? And yet I also remember during that time, right after Brendan died, Greg and Marion coming to our house and talking about it with us, and Marion wrestling with the pain and the anger of losing her son. And, and, and just working through it with my wife, Kimberly, in our living room. But you know what? This doesn't agree, disagree with what Paul is saying. It doesn't disagree with the story from the scripture. You see, Marion, was, you were wrestling with God just like Jacob in the Old Testament. And you know what? Just like Jacob, Marion, you didn't let go. 
until you got that blessing. Amen. And you are here every Sunday with your husband and you are celebrating the goodness of our God. Not only that, but because of your perseverance and your holding on, you've been a huge blessing to the rest of the body. Has anyone been blessed by the Armstrongs in this church? Can I hear an amen? Now that, that's worth celebrating. One last example, two weeks ago, we prayed here for the Silversmith family, Kelly, Nolan, and Cameron. They lost their husband and father a few years ago suddenly, and now Nolan, at 20 years old, has been diagnosed with cancer. And we had a prayer time for him. The whole church came up. And do you know who led that prayer time? Greg Armstrong. Who better prepared to lead that than a number another member of the body. And the silversmiths are continuing to go through real suffering and stress and anxiety. And Nolan started, if you don't know, he started an aggressive course of chemotherapy a couple days ago. And you know what? Praise God, his body is reacting well to it. And we keep praying for his healing. And while they're going through that, there's people in this body coming around them, led by Shelly Gillette, who has just moved in to be a partner with that family in this time of need. She's organizing meals. There's prayer chains going around. And I know that many people in this body every day are praying for healing and recovery for knowing and blessing on that family. We don't celebrate their suffering, but we can celebrate that they have a body of believers that come around them through this time. They are not alone, amen? So we, I've talked a lot about celebrating in suffering, but it would be risk to say, we need to celebrate in the good times as well. And it will look different. And I think about Creekside as a body and what we do to reach out to our community with the love of Christ. And I don't have to look any further than this and out there in this VBS we're gonna be hosting. And on, I think starting a month tomorrow, there's gonna be 100 kids in this room all week and led by Diane and the team, and a lot of you will be here volunteering. And it will be hard work. I'm sure it'll be tiring and frustrating, but at times it'll be fun. And I encourage you while you're doing it, celebrate God and let them see you celebrate. They need to know desperately what a good God we have. And this is our opportunity to do it. And if you're not here, if you can't make it, pray for it that this would be a place of fun and of celebration and people would encounter the living God. You know, when David brought the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem, the city of David, it says he danced with all his might. And all the houses of Israel were bringing the Ark of the Lord with joyful shouting and the sound of trumpet. Now I've danced, but I don't think I've danced with all my might. I know Diana has, and I've seen it, and that's celebration. But that's the celebration that was going on. In Nehemiah, remember when they came back from exile from Babylon, it says when they, when they dedicated the walls of the city, the temple wasn't even done, just the walls. It says on that day, they offered great sacrifices and celebrated because God had given them great joy. And the women and children celebrated as well so that the joy of Jerusalem was heard from far away. The celebration was so raucous that they could hear it from miles around. We need to celebrate the great things that God is doing in our midst and not be afraid to let people hear it. When we get to heaven, do you know what our Father has planned for us? It's not a quiet prayer service. And that's good, but that's not the plan. Isaiah 25, 6 prophesies the following. The Lord of hosts will prepare a lavish banquet for all peoples on the mountain, a banquet of aged wine and choice pieces with marrow. It's going to be a massive celebration. This is who we are. This is our heritage, our history, and that is our future. We are a people of celebration. Sometimes it's subdued and paired with suffering and difficulties. and other times, it's loud and raucous and paired with the finest food and the best wine. But at all times, we are called to celebrate in Christ. Are you with me? Amen? I will say again, celebrate, celebrate, celebrate. I feel like I'm at a rally. To the, 
To say the same things again is no trouble. So let us keep on celebrating in Christ in all that we go through. Amen? Amen. Amen.